Let's bow. Father, as we turn to your word now, we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts to what you have to teach to us. Amen. Have you ever tried to learn something and felt like no matter how many times it was explained to you, you weren't going to get it? Or have you ever tried to teach somebody and had the feeling that you just weren't going to get through? You simply had a hard time getting an idea through somebody's thick head, which is just another way of saying someone is hard-headed. Or perhaps you became frustrated with yourself and said, I just can't learn that. You know, teaching is hard. It's especially hard when you're teaching people who don't really want to learn. People who have their minds made up and, frankly, don't want to be confused with the facts. Sometimes I feel bad about that, but then I read the Gospels and recognize that we, I shouldn't feel too bad about having difficulty getting through to people because Jesus experienced the same thing. Our text marks the third time in three chapters of the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is, is recorded as telling his disciples in vivid, pointed language exactly what was going to happen to him once they reached Jerusalem. But even after three different lessons, the disciples didn't get it. If you open your Bibles to Mark, we're going to look first at Mark chapter 8, in verse 31, where Jesus, we are told, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. Mark goes on to tell us that Jesus said it plainly. The result of Jesus speaking plainly is often more remembered than the fact that he spoke plainly. Because the verses immediately after Jesus plainly told his disciples what was in store for him, he has a confrontation with Peter, which resulted in Jesus saying to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. And let's face it, it's so much more fun to quote to someone, Get behind me, Satan, than to quote, Jesus was going to go to Jerusalem to be killed and risen again. The second time Jesus foretold his death and his resurrection comes in Mark chapter 9. Mark tells us that they were passing through Galilee and that Jesus did not want to be interrupted since he was teaching his disciples. And what he said was this, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. You would think, given this is the second time Jesus said this, the disciples would go, huh, maybe we should investigate this a little bit more, but the message doesn't sink in. Mark says very plainly, they didn't understand what he was, the, the saying, and they were afraid to ask. Imagine walking with the greatest teacher in the world and being afraid to ask for clarification. Maybe you've experienced some professors like this or teachers like this that if you ask them to clarify, they just say this, the exact same words over again. I had a philosophy professor in college who did that. You know, he would, he would say something and, and, and someone would say, what does that mean? And then he would repeat word for word the exact same thing he just said for five minutes. The guy had an amazing memory that confused all of us. The disciples are walking with Jesus and they, they're afraid to ask for clarification. Maybe the disciples didn't want to appear dumb. You know, people might look at you askance if you ask a stupid question. And, and that old adage, there are no stupid questions? Really? Who came up with that? There really are some stupid questions. Just saying, you know, if someone says there are no stupid questions, that's an invitation for you to look stupid. 
The disciples, maybe they didn't want to look stupid. Perhaps they, they just adhered to some variation of Proverbs 17, 28. That's a verse that says this, Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Or a more modern twist to that, It is better to be thought a fool and be silent than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Unfortunately for the disciples in Mark chapter 9, Mark clarifies that their silence is not due to not under, that it is indeed due to not understanding. They really were kind of dumb about it. So rather than ask Jesus what he meant, they instead enter an argument about who's the greatest. Why? <laughs> Jesus makes this amazing announcement and say, you know, I think I'm greater than you are. Yeah. I'm, I'm greater than the worship team because I preach and they just play the piano and play the guitar. And they just say, well, no, I'm greater than you because I can play the guitar. And I've heard you sing. Really? You know? This isn't about us. It's about Jesus. The disciples, well, I wonder who's greater. So Jesus brings it up a third time. Now, just as a side note for us, kind of a bonus that can transform your relationships. If your spouse, your friend, your doctor your child, anyone close to you, brings up something three different times, you probably ought to investigate the issue with them more completely. They're sticking with it. They really want to open up this conversation. So that's just a a side note, an observation I have. You know, listen to your spouse. By the third time they bring something up, they're starting to get antsy. And then after that, it could get ugly because they're going to figure out other ways to get your attention. Jesus brings it up a third time. After teaching on the impossibility of doing anything to gain entrance into heaven, it being a gift for God of all, and all, disciples are back on the road and Jesus brings up the topic again, which is our text for today, Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 35. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. This is the word of God. This is, this time, it's as though the disciples didn't even hear anything Jesus said. That's where the discourse ends. There's no follow-up. Instead, in the verses to, to follow... James and John come to Jesus and ask Jesus to do whatever they ask of him. Think of the audacity of that. Jesus has just for the third time opened his heart to the disciples and they totally ignore him. So Jesus, I know you say you're going to die and stuff, but when you come to your kingdom, can I sit at your right hand? And can my bro sit on your left hand? They totally ignore him. So I want to draw our attention to three observations. The first is simply that Jesus was absolutely determined to go to Jerusalem. He had his face set to the city. It is only in this third lesson that Mark tells us that the destination is Jerusalem. But but since we've read to the end of the book, we know that it was Jerusalem. They are going up to Jerusalem. Mark 10, 46 says that that, that, that along the way, they have passed through Jericho. Jericho is actually only about 18 miles from Jerusalem. But the distance in elevation, it it changes from about 800 feet below sea level to about 3,000 feet above sea level. So they were indeed going up to Jerusalem. This event takes place on the cusp of Palm Sunday. It is recorded in Mark chapter 11, and we're in Mark chapter 10 right now. 
I think we'll get to that in either three, in three weeks. I think I have two more sermons in Mark chapter 10. How can one chapter have so many sermons? Anyway, we read in Mark chapter 11 that Jesus enters Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna in the highest. His determination to go to Jerusalem is not merely to celebrate the Passover along with other faithful Jews. He, his determination was based on the task he had to do once he arrived there. He recognized that God had called him that in, the, in the council of the triune God. This was the moment. There was no turning back. And even in his humanity, there was no hesitancy on his part. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. The second observation is this. Jesus knew what he was doing. I find this really important. It's not as though he kind of thought, well, I'd like to go to Jerusalem, and it's pretty cool, and it's a neat city, you know, it's pretty wonderful. You know, I'm... I was really blessed by you all to send me there a year ago. It's fantastic. It's, it's this ancient city, in it, and even it, with its modern conveniences, you get this air of just wonder. Maybe he just wanted to go to enjoy the city. No. He knew exactly what he was doing. His lessons on what would happen to him are progressive. The first two lessons are basically the same. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They'll kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he'll rise again. And it's interesting that Jesus refers to himself in the third person as the Son of Man. And that wasn't new for him. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has used this term in reference to himself. And it started back in Mark chapter 2, where Jesus healed the paralytic who was dropped down through the hole in the roof. You remember that when Jesus spoke to the man, rather than immediately healing him, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. That's a powerful statement. And all those who sitting around there understood that this was something way beyond the normal rabbi. And of course, it caused no little stir among the theologians present who asked, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Christ responded with this statement in Mark chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed, and walk? Now, the implied answer to that, it's a lot easier to say your sins are forgiven because there's no proof. But if you say, rise up and take, take up your bed and walk, there's pretty evident proof that what you did really happened. But Jesus said, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to, on earth to forgive sins, he turns to the paralytic, he says, take up your bed and go home. So we recognize that his power to, to bring healing to the paralytic gives uh, him the authority to say your sins are forgiven, but he refers to himself as the Son of Man. Could anyone present have missed the fact that he was calling himself the Son of Man. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man again at the end of Mark chapter 2, and then in Mark 8, both in his first lesson concerning his death and resurrection and in his teaching on denying yourself and following him, Jesus again identifies himself as the Son of Man. Having thus identified himself as the Son of Man, Jesus then goes on to tell the disciples in great detail what will happen once he gets to Jerusalem. This particular passage, by the way, has been a a, a source of much uh, reflection and and questions. And and the the thing is that people look at it and say, well, how could Jesus have known all these things? Because Jesus identifies six different details which await him. And there are some people who say, well, this, this must have been... Well, written after the fact so they could impose those details now because there's no way Jesus could have known that. And to that I say, why not? Make no bones about it. Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. He would be delivered into the, to the chief priests and the scribes. And if you look ahead to Mark chapter 14, verse 53, you read that they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together together. 
He said he would be sentenced to death. And if you read ahead in Mark chapter 14, verse 64, we are told that they all condemned him as deserving death. He then said he would be delivered into the hands of the Romans. That happens in Mark chapter 15, verse 1. He told the disciples he would be mocked, spit upon, and flogged. And lo and behold, in Mark 14, 65 and 15, 19, they spit upon him. In Mark 15, 15, we are told they flogged him. In Mark 15, 20, we are told that they mocked him. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him when he got to Jerusalem. He told his disciples that he would be executed. And the crucifixion is recorded in Mark 15, 20 to 39. But then Jesus also said something else, something which has given mankind hope for 2,000 years. He said that he would rise on the third day, and that too is included in the Scriptures. And we call that, that Sunday Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It is the height of Christianity that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He knew exactly what he was doing when he set his fate towards Jerusalem. And that is amazing. Because he knew on that day, the third time he told his disciples what was going to happen, he knew he was doing it out of love for you and me. That is the power of this passage. Jesus knew it was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And he went anyway. Now, is one other thing we see in our text. The disciples didn't understand it. When Jesus led the way, the text tells us that those around him were amazed and afraid. Why were they amazed? And why were they afraid? They're in Jerusalem, and they're in Jericho, and on. They, they must have known that there were loads of people traveling to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Are they amazed that Jesus is going to Jerusalem? And what are they afraid of? Jesus didn't say that when we get there, y'all are going to be crucified. He said, when you get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be killed. Mark tells us of the emotions of the crowd before Jesus gives his detailed description of what awaits him. Perhaps some of them had sensed that something significant was about to happen. Maybe some of them had heard about Jesus talking to the disciples concerning his upcoming trials. And if they did, then the actions of Jesus make no sense. For instance, if you knew that on your way home from church today, you were going to be driving down Highway 50 and perhaps wanting to get to the safety of your home a little quicker than necessary, you were exceeding the speed limit, and if you knew there was going to be a police officer there who was going to pull you over and give you a ticket, or worse yet, threaten you with your life, would you drive home on Highway 50? If you knew that, that there was a place that if you went there, your life would fall apart, wouldn't you just go a different place? Who would do what Jesus is doing? Why? Why would they do what Jesus was doing? And since very few of those people in the crowd had ever seen someone resurrected from the dead, the idea that someone would predict his own resurrection was most certainly outside their comprehension. Even for us who base our faith on the resurrected Christ, very few of us go to the hospital and see somebody who has just passed away, or very few of us go to a wake with the expectation that the stiff is going to sit up. It just doesn't happen. 
And Jesus says, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise again. Looking at it from this side of the resurrection, we see that the disciples were at best confused. They simply didn't understand the significance of what Jesus was teaching. We know that because twice when Jesus brought up this topic, the disciples just went on their merry way and got into arguments about greatness. The first time Jesus brought it up in Mark 8, Peter tried unsuccessfully to challenge the idea. So it appears that the disciples just let it drop. They didn't understand what Jesus was doing. They didn't understand what he was saying. And even if they did, they simply didn't like what he was saying, so they just ignore it. And here's the kicker to me. It strikes me that we are just like the disciples. We often don't understand what Jesus is doing. We often don't like what Jesus is saying. So we just ignore it. God has laid out in Scripture all sorts of truths which we don't like and would rather ignore. I guess when I see the response of the disciples, this is what strikes me most powerfully. When first confronted with the truth, they argued against it. And then they just ignore it. And that is so much like us. Now, I don't know today what truths of Scripture God keeps bringing to your mind. I don't know how or why you have chosen to ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit, but I know you are human, at least most of you. Pause for laughter. I know you're human. And because you are human, you are not that different from the disciples. There are some topics, some passages of Scripture, which you just ignore. That Christ keeps bringing into your mind. That some preacher on the radio brings up and you keep hearing the same topic over and over and you just turn off the dial. I'm reminded of, of, of my father. Thirty years ago, I was, we had cassette tapes. You remember those things? And I was visiting him once, and we were riding someplace, and, and on the console of his car, he had a cassette of one of my sermons. And I was pleasantly surprised, and so I said, Dad, what did I preach about? And he said, I have no idea. I just like hearing your voice. I have no idea what God wants to speak to me about. I just like hearing your voice. That's part of our humanity. Jesus keeps bringing to our mind, the Holy Spirit brings to our mind the same issue, the same verses, two, three, four, five, a hundred times, and we just keep on ignoring it. There are topics that you ignore but I remind you that Jesus wants to get through to you. So I propose two responses to this text. The first comes from the first two points, that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Reflect upon the willingness of Jesus to go to Jerusalem and all that means. When he determined to go to Jerusalem, he did it out of obedience to God the Father and out of love for you. He knew exactly what he was doing, he knew exactly what he was going to face. He knew that he was going to be crucified, not for his sins, but for our sins, and he did it anyway. He knew that the disciples took his, he knew that when he took his disciples apart to tell them what lay ahead, that it would result in his agonizing death. And he knew that the one thing that made it worth it was all worth it all was the power of the resurrection in victory over death. His love for you was so great that he willingly 
went up to Jerusalem. And God would have us be amazed at this, at his great love for us. That he would have us recognize the message of Scripture that we are still trapped in sin. That Christ, while we are still trapped in sin, Christ died for us. How great the Father's love for us. How great our Savior's love for us. How great the debt we owe to the one who willingly went up to Jerusalem to face rejection, the flogging, to be spit upon, to be mocked and nailed to a cross. How great our rejoicing that at the end of his suffering came victory over death, the resurrection, which gives us hope for the future. And how we long for that great and coming day when Jesus will return, when in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will see him. So reflect upon the willingness of our Savior to go to Jerusalem for us. But then also, reflect upon the things that God is seeking to teach you. They may not be from this text, but you know what things they are. The text which you've read and which piqued your interest and which caused you initially to argue against them. Don't allow yourself to be distracted. But study his word until you understand his expectations of you. Stop ignoring Jesus. On that day, just a few days before Palm Sunday, Jesus told his disciples what was going to happen. And they argued about who was greatest. Throughout the Word of God, we are told things that we ought to do, things that are going to happen. Let's not argue about greatness. Let's not argue about things which are of eternal insignificance. Let's respond to His Word. Let's respond to His sacrifice through our rejoicing and our worship. And in our rejoicing and worship, let us be obedient to the causes which Christ brings to our heart. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege that you've given us of seeing the great love of Jesus. And I ask today that you would impress upon our hearts whatever passage of Scripture you deem important for us to respond to today and give us the strength of character to respond as you would have us respond. In the name of Jesus, amen.